Maverick Carter, thank you for uh, coming on to Lion Tree's version of the shop. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, brother. <laughs> Thank you for having me, Ari. I appreciate it. My pleasure. This is uh, this is Kindred, and Kindred's all about our friends, our people, and uh, also purpose, and giving uh, inspirational stories, not just messages, but stories about uh, where we've come from, where we're going. Uh, you come from Akron. I grew up in Baltimore. Yep. It reminds me a lot of each other. We have very similar places, yep. absolutely. We discovered each other uh, recently uh, in a deeper level. Yeah, but when it comes, when you think about the word Kindred, we discovered each other... I don't even remember when, but it seems like I've known you 25 or 30 years I know. now. But that I was know. a couple of months ago or something. We yeah. really connected. I know. Well, we, I think we were we were always talking business. I know we intersect on a lot of business ideas and ventures. You're on the board of Live Nation of with course. our friend Rapino, uh, who's a star. And um, But then we were at an event, and uh, we went downstairs after the event, and I think Busta Rhymes was uh, yeah, that's performing. Right. Exactly. And you looked over, and you're like... Uh, Wait a second here. <laughs> <laughs> well, by that time, you were the you were the only guys that still had a suit jacket on as you as you normally do. But the fact that you had a suit jacket on and you knew every word of Buster Rhymes, I was like, "What the hell? I need to know your story. Why? Why you were this and no? And Buster Rhymes raps really fast, so it's hard to yeah. put with the word. Yeah, he's one of my favorites. Yes, Streets of Baltimore. You know, exactly. You can never leave it. Exactly. Take it with you everywhere. Exactly. It's a secret weapon. As I as I get in those boardrooms. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but this is not about me. It's about you. So, um, um, I want to talk about uh, Untitled, Spring Hill, your relationship with LeBron, and really where Maverick is going. Yep. But take me through like really like the roots of Akron because you tell me like that's really where it all started for you that's where it all started for me and as you said your um, memory of lyrics and hip hop lyrics is a secret weapon in the boardroom I would say the same thing for me part of my secret weapon in the boardroom is or if I go into meetings or whatever you want to call it is the this, I call it the spirit of hip hop having the audacity of hip hop um which I got as a youngster listening to hip hop and having the audacity to be able to go into a board meeting at Live Nation and say, you know, I've been on that board. Uh, again, shout out to Rapino. He put me on the board in 2018. I'm not in the music business, but I love hip hop. And But more importantly, to be able to go in that room and, you know, as you know, you get in the boardroom, there's a lot of acronyms, AOI, and this and that. And me go, whoa, whoa wait, guys, one second. I don't know what the fuck that means. <laughs> so can someone tell me? Um, and they're like, oh, yeah, annual operating income. I'm like, got it. Okay, clear. I got it. I'm clear now. But to have the audacity to sit there and be myself, admit what I don't know, but also if I know something about a topic, to expand on it. So that's one of my secret weapons. My other one is being from Akron. Um, we're kind of the little brother to Cleveland as cities go and I think you know Cleveland sometimes gets beat up nationally so they kind of it's like the big brother who gets beat up turns and beats on the little brother so <laughs> we always act and we have a chip on our shoulder I think you know LeBron probably goes into the games 20 years in and still has that chip I definitely do but also growing up in Akron the way I grew up my grandmother who named me really taught me and I got my first glimpse, and she didn't even know. She probably didn't even know what the word entrepreneur was to the day she died. But I got to see how an entrepreneur, not forget how you run a business, because as you know, that's extremely hard, and it comes with all type of difficulties day in, day out. But how you treat people and maintain and foster relationships, and then how to spot someone who's not good for you is what I learned because she ran after hours where, where I grew up in as a kid, and that was my first job when I was five. So how she treated and greeted and, and cared for people and was curious about them and not just interested in how she would make money off of them running her business, but she really cared about the people as a secret weapon that I learned and use to this day. By the way, entrepreneur is interesting because um, we always talk about it. It's like one of these like almost slang buzzwords, cultural words. Barry Ditto told me that that's a made-up word of our generation. Like, in his generation, they didn't use the word entrepreneur. They just did things. Well, they just right. built businesses. Mm -hmm. So the you double-click on it, and you're talking about exactly what you just said, which is what are the characteristics of an entrepreneur? Exactly. And that's the baseline. That is the baseline. And then you just build off of that. Yeah. Right? And either you have it or you don't, or you want to jump into the unknown based on those weapons, so to speak. 
uh, and apply them and adapt yourself in different cycles and different times, or you don't have it and you play into normal structures. Totally. When did you first know that you had it? I, you know, to Barry Diller's point, I didn't know, you know, my career started as an intern at Nike, then I worked there in Beaver and Oregon as a consultant. I'm sorry, I went back to college, but they kept me on as a consultant and they hired me. And then I left to start my own business, but I left because LeBron asked me, I, you know, I felt like Nike was my dream job. My dream was to stay there and be a, and a, you know, work at Nike my whole career and be an executive. I would have been just happy doing that. But then when I left, and I, I think I got exposed to um, companies and starting companies and started my own and investments and looking at other ones is when I learned it. But what I really learned is, and it's funny, I was having this conversation the other day uh, over lunch with Joel Embiid, who, who he and I have developed a nice relationship and he's a, a, one of the most graceful, gracious people I've met, extremely smart, really thoughtful, obviously a super talented basketball player, but he's just, you know, he was in LA and just wanted to come by and ask me questions just about starting companies, investing, and like being a basketball player who wants to do more and all this. And I said to him, I said, listen, as a basketball player, but then also as an entrepreneur, the one of the key things, and, and I see people who are very successful like yourself, is you have to be user friendly. Mm -hmm. I said, you have to be very user friendly. And I don't give a damn how good your idea is. You have to be user friendly. The people that you work with have to be able to use you and communicate with you. Then you're gonna need other people, whether you're selling them your product or you need to buy something from them. You need to be user friendly. And I told him, it's pretty easy to be user friendly and people fuck it up all yeah. the time. Like, pick up the phone, call people back. If you say you're gonna do something, do it. Yep. If you say you're gonna be there, be there. Those are like the, that's like the easiest things to do. And I was explaining this to him and I was saying, the one thing about me and my company, Spring Hill, uninterrupted, working with talent, working with creators, working with other business. We do so many partnerships. Our whole business is an ecosystem of working with writers, directors, athletes, creating content, then selling it to Apple, Amazon, this, that, working with big brands like Nike and Google and Epic. The key to all of that is we have to be, our company has to be, we have to have amazing ideas and we have to be user friendly. Yep. You have to be able to extract the ideas and partner with people. And for me, I've kind of always been user friendly because I like people. Um, I'm curious about the world, so I like to learn from people. And I think... And you see people for who they are and where they are. Exactly. Right? And I do what I say I'm going to do. If I can't do it, I say I can't do it. And you tell people and you give them notice. And it's like so easy to be user friendly. And that is a big part of being running any company. I don't give a damn what company you run. Even Steve Jobs is, is made rest in peace. As great as he was and he built the biggest company in the world. He had to be user friendly to work with his team around him, all the people around him, like Johnny Ives and Woj. He was user. He worked with the music business and artists, and like you just have. To, it's just a thing you have to be. Or people start going like, "I'm not talking to him," and then you're done. Yeah, but you also have to have a framework for how you're gonna live your life, right? Totally. That's beyond business. It's purposeful. I read that you know for Spring Hill, and you modeled this maybe after like your upbringing in Akron. You said, "I need 50-50 employees, men and women." You have, mm -hmm. the, you have the majority of people of color. Yep. Like you have to actually like back up what you say. You have to, again, <laughs> you have to do what you say you're going to do yeah. and like commit to something. You also have to commit to something, right? That's another thing people sometimes miss. Meaning you have to say, this is plant, my, plant your flag and, and that's what you have to be. And when you say you're going to do something, you have to do it. And I, we set out to build, you know, a, crea a company that is a creative company that tells stories and creates content that de develops IP that we then can take and do bring it to uh, life in many different ways through commercialization. And our aspiration, right? And it's, as I always say, it's arrogant. But to me, every entrepreneur has arrogant aspiration. That's, that's a key attribute of an entrepreneur. It's like, you say I'm going to do something before you've done one thing, and it's like aspirational and arrogant. It's a vision. It's a vision. So, um, I wanted to build Disney for culture. That was the that, that's the that's the aspiration still to this day. So we had to be creativity had to be at the center. So our creative team and what we make, we live and die by the ideas we come up with or don't come up with. So in order to get to amazing ideas, you actually 
it forces you. I was committed to it because it's part of the business and part of who I am to build a very diverse company because if you put two people in the room who come from the same place, who live the same, who live in the same neighborhood, you're most likely not going to get discourse. And from my point of view, discourse always leads to the best ideas where you go like, you feel one way, I feel another way. It could be about dinner tonight. Or you could be like, man, let's go to dinner. And I'm like, oh, I don't like that place. Yeah. But if we always eat the same thing, and you go, well, what do you want to go? And I say, this place. And you go, well, I don't think that place is that good. Then we, it forces you and I both to pick the best place, and we end up with the best option yeah. because we've had this back and forth. Yeah, I call that like the stew of life. You put all the best ingredients into the stew, and it tastes much better exactly. than if I had my own view of my own ingredients. I want the best ingredients in there, and whatever I thought were good last year are now like bland. Exactly. You know? Exactly. So now at our company, we're uh, just over 200 people. It's exactly 50-50 male to uh, female, and it's 67% people of color. But more importantly, those are definitely markers of diversity, but more importantly, if you come uh, and meet our team, there are people from South America, there are people from Argentina, Brazil, there are people from Europe, there are people from all over the states, there are people from Aust we have a creative guy from Australia, people from New Mexico, they're from all over the world, and they're from different backgrounds, and some love sport lovers, some people loved art, different social so that really leads to true diversity like the 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 gender thing is definitely diversity the uh people of color is definitely diversity but then i'm really proud of how diverse our team is geographically economically everything but it leads to amazing ideas because we're always getting that discourse that i actually root for and kind of push for in the company so that is that what the disney of culture means it's having a cultural diversity of ideas Yes. Platform. Yeah, and and from a you know we're not reinventing anything. That Disney obviously. It always sounds funny when I say Disney. Like I don't want to. I'm not meaning to compare our company to Disney, but that's the aspiration, right? Because what, when you say when I say Disney, when you say Disney, what do you think of? So here's what you think of. You think of a company that is a creative, entertainment, and content company. But really, what they are, they're a brand machine. They pump out IP through content and storytelling that they then bring to life. It's a very matrix company because you have to think on one end, they make movies. On a whole other end, they make roller coasters. I couldn't think of two things further apart <laughs> in business. I mean, that's, you know what I mean? It's and like, Hannah Montana and everything. Yeah, you it. make movies. Making movies is a whole different set of people in a whole different part of the country mm -hmm. that come up with movie ideas and writers and directors. And roller coasters like engineers, and, and very delicate engineers to like build, so. And Imagineers, they call them. Imagineers, but the thread that they pull is happiness. How does their movie make you happy? How does the roller coaster make you happy? And everything in between, the hats, the t-shirts, they, they just hold on to that thread, which is brilliant, right? And that thread, they're like, happiness. How do we make the happiest place on earth? How do the movies make you happy? So that is what I think of when I think of Disney. And happiness is a feeling. Happiness is an emotion and a feeling. And, a feeling. and, and every brand needs an emotional attachment. And at Spring Hill and Uninterrupted, our thread is empowerment. And we live by it. We commit to it. So everything we do on the fr uh, front of the uh, top of the funnel is storytelling, movies, TV, content with brands. But we always do it through the lens of empowerment. And empowerment can show up in a couple of different ways it can show up in a way that the content is literally empowering. So if you watch our show, The Shop, it's about community empowerment, bringing people together from all walks of life that you would never see, that you would never expect to be together having a conversation. is about bringing in the community together and having different perspectives. Or it can come in the form of, we made a movie called House Party, and our director, Kyle Maddock, has never directed a feature film. So we're empowering a creator there. So creativity is at the center of what we do, like Disney. Their thread is happiness. Our thread is empowerment. So now when we take the shop that has become a, a decent-sized piece of IP for us and we're going to do a physical location, well, that physical location has to be about empowering the community. So that will affect where it's located. That will affect the programming at the place. That will affect everything that happens for that physical location and the show. So that's, when I say Disney for culture, that's what I mean, and pulling that thread of empowerment through everything that we do, like Disney does. Yeah. And really being an IP-led company. I, and I always tell people, 
I'm fortunate because um, I did not graduate from a formal college, but people ask me, where'd you graduate? I say Nike, I graduated, so I learned what I know there. And I always tell people Nike and Disney are much, much more close than, than Disney is to Sony or Warner Brothers or Paramount. They're much more like Nike. The only difference is at the top of the funnel, Nike uses LeBron and Serena and Tiger and Michael Jordan and these, and Disney uses Captain America and the Avengers and the Toy Story characters. But at the top of the funnel, they're connecting with you through emotion. And Disney's emotion is happiness and Nike's emotion is high performance and victory. Nike literally is a Greek word for victory. Then once you're in, they sell you different products, right. but it doesn't matter. The okay, top, so, they, so, tell, they story tell. So Spring Hill and the shop, Hustle, you've gotten a lot of Emmy Awards and nominations. Who are your characters? Our characters, so we always use, our thread is empowerment. Our characters are always real life people. And we build brands and IP around real life people, just like we launched this brand, Hanakuma, with Naomi Osaka. So Naomi is what story she wants to tell is how that brand will come to life. We have a brand called Love Is with Megan Rapino and Sue Bird. So we've that's all about supporting the LGBTQ community. And we've told a lot of stories with that brand. We're doing a license deal with a couple big companies now for Love Is. So we're bringing Love Is to life in many ways. So our characters are always real life people who are about empowerment or who we want to empower. Got it. So the shop, for example, how did that how did that idea come? And like, because you are, it does. Uh, you love it because I can see when you're doing it, you're bringing different people together, creating a discourse, a conversation where they wouldn't otherwise be talking to each other except for through your convening power. Yes. And you're bringing um, entertainment, sports, culture, politicians, inspiration, politicians together in a room and you get you have reach now it's on YouTube and moved it from HBO and people can watch it. So take me through like how that idea came to be and like what was the last shop you did and like who are some of the characters? Yeah, so the um, the idea came to be based off the real life experience of the barbershop in every community, but obviously I experienced it in a black community. I grew up in a predominantly, basically all black community. But if you went in the barbershop in the neighborhoods that I grew up in and my partners grew up in on a Saturday morning, you really, it was a reflection of the community and some the men and women. You would think it's just men, but there were women there because they were there with their kids or they brought their son there. But it was a real reflection of the community. And what I mean that, like in my neighborhood barbershop, you'd have like the policeman sitting there waiting to get his hair cut. You'd have the drug dealer sitting there to wait, waiting to get his hair cut. You have the guy who worked at the Chrysler factory sitting there waiting to get his hair cut. You'd have the local high school basketball star waiting there, the little kid with his mom who was a social worker. So then they're all sitting there and there's four or five people in the chair and then there's this couches where everyone's the, the kind of the waiting room. But then ensued there'd be a conversation and the conversation could zig and zag and it could be about sports, it could be about, po about politics. And each member of the community would go in and out of the conversation with their point of view and their perspective. And, but it, usually the conversation centered around the community, right? Like what's happening at the local high school basketball team and, and what's happening with the local community and what's going on. And then it would get to some national things, right? NFL football would be a like whatever. So um, our CMO, uh, Paul Rivera, PR as I call him, him and uh, Randy, who's like my brother, LeBron chief of staff, they had this idea to take that feeling and that Saturday afternoon in the barbershop where we grew up and they actually the first idea was to make it a podcast and we were all set to make it a podcast we went to a, one of our partners beats and their CMO to his credit Omar was like you guys got cold here but a podcast is too small we should make it video and we shot the first one in Toronto 2014 and it just took off and it went and went we did a couple ourselves with beats then HBO came calling, and we did four seasons on HBO, and now we've done, um, now we're in the fifth season officially, and we do it on YouTube, which has been great for us. HBO was a fantastic partner, really appreciate them, they helped us launch it, but YouTube, with a click of a button, we become international, so right. 
I was in London a couple of weeks ago and people were like thanking me. Like I was like, what did I do for you? I don't know. You and they're like, well, we can now watch. Thank, we can now watch the shop. We don't have to search for it, so it makes it international. It makes us be able to have more flexibility creatively. So, if there's an episode that should be 45 minutes, we can now do that on HBO. We couldn't because they're a cable network, so the episodes always had to be edited to 28 minutes. Now, if we want to take an episode and chop it into 230s or 220s, we can. It just gives us more flexibility, and we brought in a great partner in the Vodka, uh, Grey Goose, which has been great, which we couldn't integrate brands before. So it's just been fantastic in the shop. We believe has so many more legs. We're looking at how do we bring it to life in physical. We're looking how do we bring it to life in products. We've done apparel. We've done candles. So we're going to keep expanding that brand and that IP, the shop. But the thread will always be about how are we really empowering the community. Yeah. What was the last one you recorded? We recorded on Sunday, and um, it was pretty amazing. Everybody was coming up and saying, our director, all the team, all the productions, who was our best one ever, literally this Sunday, this past Sunday before this, in New York, and we had uh, Idris Elba, Drew Barrymore, Kyrie, and Paul Rabel. It was really, really, and me and PR, of course, who were always on as kind of the pseudo host, but it was really powerful and strong episode. What was the, la- what was the takeaway? Of the last one? Mm-hmm. The takeaway was that you know, Drew Barrymore said something that I, that I felt so good, but I had never thought of it. She said, she said she's a fan of the show. She said it on the show. She says, I'm a fan of this show. I watch it all the time. And the thing I love the most, she says, you guys have an ability to go deep, but not be heavy. And I was like, wow, I never thought about it that way. And that was the takeaway. The show, the episode is very deep. There's like a slight heavy moment when, because Drew starts crying and then we all start crying, although PR claims he was he had sweat in his eye, <laughs> claims he wasn't crying, but Carrie we, was all, crying. we all dropped a tear. Wow. Um, but it's very deep and personal and it gets very personal. And what I always notice when we're doing the show, we've had, you know, Barack Obama and David Beckham and yeah. Jay-Z yeah. and James Corden and we've had Chelsea Handler and we've had so many, Drew Barrymore, so many amazing people is that Tom Brady Tom Brady and we've had so many people but once you break the ice people just open up people are dying to open up yeah like I thought it was so amazing that they get picked up that Brady on the show said because I always wondered this and I know Tom pretty well and I knew this but it was just interesting to hear him say it when he's giving an interview after the game and he said this he's not saying what he really wants to say and he said this on the shop like he goes, 98% of what I'm saying is just like getting through the interview. I'm not actually spilling out all my feelings in the interview, which you can watch and you can tell he's a pro and he's yeah, he's, he's got his talking point yeah. and, he's, and he's done and he's out. But, you know, once we break that ice and it's like once one person comes like gets deep and everybody like it's like a therapy session almost, but it's never heavy because we, you know, we always add some levity and some laughter and because that is being true to the barbershop like you know people interrupt people and it's like on the last episode Drew we were talking everyone was talking and someone started talking and Drew kept saying she would say like to the person hey can I ask you a question I said Drew this is the shop don't fucking ask him to ask a question just throw it out there just ask you don't have to say can I ask you a question we don't do that here so but her statement of being deep without heavy I thought was really good yeah that's great and so Spring Hill overall though is content production empowerment you have investors uh, yep. i think the last round validated at, you know almost like 800 million dollars yep. valuation and the best is yet to come you have a lot of projects hustle obviously is out there on netflix now it's a great show great movie with adam sandler um what's to come with spring hill i think for us you know whatever we were valued at whatever but our mission of empowering greatness in all individuals we're just as you said it's early we, we've done a lot but we got so much more to go from this what our company stands for is an emotion and that emotion is global so i think you know going global with that whether it's ourselves or with a partner or getting a bigger platform to really tap in with people on this emotion we've seen it come to fruition in a real way. When we started Uninterrupted, which is our athlete empowerment brand all about sports, 
it was like nobody was really doing it. I mean, uh, Jeter had started the Players Tribune, but it was so different than what we were doing. We were trying to build a brand. They were building a media company, a website. We were building a feeling. And now you see it everywhere with like, you know, the Manning cast. That's all a version of giving athletes the platform and letting them do it or Amazon bringing on athletes to do things, simulcast of the, the games. And like, it's just everywhere. So we know that feeling is a big one and that emotion. We think we've carved out that space very well. Now our goal is to take it international, be international with it. There may even be some big pieces of IP out there that we should be, that I want to look at and, and, and really go, really go take down something big. Because you have do. cash, right? Because I have cash and we have cash available. We can go get more cash. And I think for us is to really continue to drive home that feeling of empowerment, create IP, and then bring it to life to, to people who want to be empowered in a massive way on a global basis. Yeah. Yeah. And you also haven't gone into gaming yet and no. other verticals within the broader cultural we ecosystem. Have not, we have not went all the way into gaming, but as you know, Epic Games sits on our cap table. Yes. They invest in us, and their president, who's, who I love, one of my favorite people in the world, Adam Sussman, yep. sits on our board. So we have an eye to that, and they've brought us, we've been doing, we've done a bunch of content with them, figuring out how does that emotion of empowerment fit into gaming and into the metaverse. We're working on that with them. Yep. So yes, but we have gaming to go. We have We've not launched either Spring Hill or Uninterrupted in a big way international. Um, we're, we're, we've, we're looking at taking the shop to UK. They want the shop UK really, really bad. It makes sense as the next place to do a, to do a, a very localized version for the UK with yeah. UK people. So we're going to do that. Um, do you have any people without hair on the shop? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Well, if you came to the shop, you, we, can, we can trim your beard and mustache. Yeah, you know because I mean? if you have one hair out of place, you need a haircut. Exactly, point, yeah. exactly, exactly. <laughs> I think the other thing about um, brands and uh, about you that comes across right away and with any community is trust. Totally. You know, you can't build a company, a philosophy. You can't have a vision to go all the way in the long term, especially in this environment, without having people trust you without having your employees trust you without having people trust the mission that's consistent that's pure that you're going to be around for a while you have a very trusted partnership with lebron yep how did that come to be uh both ways because um it obviously goes all the way back to childhood which is which is core because it came way back before you both had anything beyond just friendship but how did you know first that you guys could trust each other and how did it last? Because a lot of relationships get, you know, break down over time. Totally break down. Obviously, any level of trust is built over time of like showing up over and over. And I think with two people, you know, listen, he's my partner and my friend. It's so strange to think about it as I'm thinking about it now. It's like I talk to him every day in some sort of form or fashion, whether it's text or voice note or phone call. And... A lot of times it's just laughing and joking in a group, in our group text, or sometimes it's serious shit, or sometimes it's a deal or whatever. But, you know, he's quite frankly, maybe, you know, is he the famous, he might be the most famous person on earth, or one, he's definitely one of them. And I understand that, because I, I have a brain and I can understand <laughs> that, but I still just see him as my friend and like my brother. So I think the trust has developed over time of like, um, he knows I'm going to tell him exactly how the fuck I feel. And he can like it, love it, or hate it. He can tell me to get the fuck out of here, kiss his ass, or whatever. But he knows he's going to... And I know he'll do that to me. So I think over... Now it's been over 30 years of us doing that part. Plus, as I said earlier, I do what I say I'm going to do, and he does what he says he's going to do. And he does not... If he can, if he says I'm going to do something, he's the best in the world. I mean, he's so committed to everything. If he says he's going to do something, he's going to do it at one o'clock. He shows up at twelve thirty-five. He's like, but he never says to you, "Hey, Mav, like, it's been fun. You you've been great for me when I was in school, and great to launch the career and great to launch the businesses. But now I'm on to the next chapter, and like, why don't you stay back and just run these businesses for me? Never. In fact, <laughs> I've said that to him. I said to him. <laughs> You know, he, he's dead set and he's going to buy a basketball team when he's done playing. And I said, just so you, I said, just so we're fucking clear, 
I have no intention on being like the CEO of a basketball team <laughs> or the GM. No disrespect to anyone who does those jobs. That's just not what I want to do. Mm-hmm. I said, so you're going to buy a team. Great. I'll set the deal up. I'll help you work on the deal to get the team. But I have zero intentions on like being the GM and like negotiating with some, you know, little Billy's agent <laughs> that you drafted. And like, or I said, if you call me, I'll give you. But I want to go work and like keep running the company. And he's like, yeah, 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 fine. And yeah, I can yeah, tell fine. he's like, like yeah, you later. Yeah, yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. He's like, yeah, I think what he's thinking, or maybe when he hears this, he's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. He's thinking that's years from now and you'll change your mind or right. I'll help you change your right. mind. Yeah. You know, he'll probably make me, I'll, I shouldn't say make me, but he'll make me invest some money, which I'm fine to do that. Yeah. But I don't want to like be the GM of the team. This, so. is, this is Maverick Carter, the future GM of <laughs> yeah, exactly. Phil and the basketball team. <laughs> So it goes the other way sometimes, but that's our relationship. And we can, he knows I'm serious, but we'll laugh and joke about yeah. like a thing like that. And I'm like, yo, that's your dream. That ain't my dream. Right. And we can talk like that. But he never, no, he never goes like next chapter. I think if he just assumes that we're going every chapter together, and I do too. And um, except for when he gets a team, I'm, the, <laughs> I'm putting my money in and trusting that he's going to do the work and that'll be his job. He'll be done playing, yeah. but I'm out. But yes, that trust is from things like that, like me saying that to him and saying, hey, just so you know, that's your dream and I know you trust me and you want me around it. I will go to games. We can speak about it, but I'm not taking a full-time job with a basketball team. But now I understand the trust today I understand you can extrapolate that trust tomorrow but when you were 20 and he was 18 and he was coming out or you both were coming out of the projects in Spring Hill right yep. in Akron like why you why the two of you why were you in the room in that position when he had to go from high school to the world yeah um, great question I guess this will sound a little strange for Unless you can, I mean, I guess some people are going to say, but I think it it goes all the way back to he, LeBron and I played one year of high school basketball together because I'm older than him. Um, And in in that year, it was a very interesting year. I was a senior, he was a freshman, so we were three years apart. And in that year, we had a lot of success. In fact, we won every game and won the state tournament. (laughs) And, um, but we played as a team. We had me, him, and another player LeBron actually was our leading scorer as a freshman. He averaged 18 points. I averaged 17. We had another guy averaged 15. So it was a real team effort. There was not, like, even though he was averaged the most points, we all did our jobs. But I was the only senior on the team with other freshmen, a couple freshmen, a lot of sophomores, and a lot of juniors. We both uh, we went to a Catholic school in Akron called St. Vincent, St. Mary's. And I think I had been there. I understood high school basketball, and it was a big deal to be a freshman playing high school basketball. And I think in that year, I think he came to uh, follow my leadership that year along with everyone else on the team, but just talking about him, and also understand my commitment and my how I took on responsibility and how I was not a um, person who, who did not understand that a high tide raises all ships. Everything that I, that I am, he saw that that season that yeah. that from from november to march and we won right we won you were the veteran yeah i was the veteran we won the state title and i think he saw a lot in me then and then in that moment we we really developed a relationship of like big brother little brother a bit and we and we had success so that always helps right we had a lot of success that year then i went off to, to college for a year everyone wants to hear this story but People always ask me how I'm close to certain CEOs or quote unquote, you know, moguls, et cetera. And I said, there's no like schmooze factor. <laughs> like, you know, it looks that way, but in reality, you do a deal. It has to work really, really well. It has right. to crush it. And then the, then they pick up the phone again. Yeah. If it doesn't work, just make no mistake about it. They're not they picking up. There, there's no whining and dining after no, that. You know? no. It has to work. Of course. And then, it, then you can keep playing. Yes. Right? So that's what happens, right? If if you have that camaraderie and it works, and it works that's the metric. That's the metric. <laughs> Was it successful? Yeah. And people like LeBron, who are like people you deal with, 
they like to win and they win a lot in mm-hmm. life and that's that's just who they are so and they want to keep playing and they want to keep playing and they want to keep winning so we've had some losses but we've had a lot of wins together and i think it started that year and i think he just saw who i am like cuz we you know we were in a locker room together and he was lebron was a youngster but i think even at 15 and 16 he was he's so he's one of the smartest people amongst all the around the world smart people i've met he has a gift of intelligence that is as high as anyone I've ever seen. So I know he's very observant and he sees everything. So I'm sure that age, even at that age, he reta- he retains a lot too and can apply it. He just saw who I am and I think the trust started there and then it just built and then we started to do things and had more success to the point now, he it's just, it's easy. Now, you know, it's been 30 years, so it's like really easy now. Yeah, and he was a pretty good basketball player, you saw right away? He's okay. He's starting to figure it out. I he's mean, starting to figure it out. Yeah, he's starting to figure it out. Hopefully he doesn't figure it out before he's too old, but he's starting to... <laughs> he's starting There's to all his ownership, you know? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Where he's going to... By the way, that's why I want nothing to do with the team, because he's going to be frustrated that, why isn't this guy doing this or doing that? Why isn't... And I'm like, LeBron, that's what you did? Everybody's not you? Relax. Yeah, exactly. But the, the intersection of your experience with Nike, which was a huge impact on your life, but totally. also a huge impact on his life. Totally. But I just want to go to one part of the story where when LeBron was coming out of school, you know, there were sneaker contracts, right? Mm-hmm. There were shoe contracts. And Nike won. Mm-hmm. And the negotiation was really down to... Three companies. Three companies. It started with three. Back then, it, Reebok was separate of Adidas. Mm-hmm. But it was Reebok... Nike and Adidas, the Chinese brands hadn't emerged yet, and then Adidas kind of fell out, and it came down to Nike and Reebok, really. And then, at the end, it was really Phil Knight, the then CEO, mm-hmm. Nike, and LeBron, mm-hmm. and you were in the room, and how did Nike win that contract? Nike, at the end, did not offer the most money. And this is uh, this goes to who, who LeBron is, which I obviously know very well, but even knowing who someone is, when you see them do it, it's a different thing. So I've seen him do it a couple of times. But Phil and Nike, but Phil basically said to him, because they hadn't offered the most money. Reebok was 25 or 30 million more. In yeah. cash. Yeah. His first deal with Nike was, when you valued the whole thing, it was 90 million or 87 million, to be exact. But called, rounded up, called 90 million. And LeBron was about 18 years old at the time, right? He wasn't around. He was exactly 18. 18. This was in June of 2003, so he didn't turn 19 until that December. Um, and Reebok was at like $120 million uh, once all the And Nike basically said, we're not going any higher. But Phil said, let me ask you a question, LeBron. And the folks at Nike, Lynn Merritt, who worked and ran the basketball sports market, said, listen, it's very simple. Question that I'm going to ask you. The question is, how good do you think you're going to be? And LeBron said, what do you mean? And, they, and Phil said, well, do you think you're going to be, you're obviously going to the NBA. I don't think he had been drafted yet, but the lottery, but he's going to be drafted. Everyone knew that. Will you be an all, will you be a really good player? Will you be like all-star level player? Will you be like perennial all-star player? Will you be great player? Like, you know, really great. Or do you think you have a chance to be like the greatest or one of the greatest ever play? And LeBron goes, why does that matter? Before he gave his answer. And Phil goes, well, it's very simple. Because if you believe you're going to be like one of the greatest ever play or a great, then $30 million today actually means nothing because we're going to help you build a business. That, that $30 million would be like peanuts to you. But if you don't believe you're going to be like an all-time great or great, like you'll just be like an all-star, go get the $30 million now because it'll matter to you. And LeBron goes, I'm definitely going to be one of the greatest to ever play. That's how I feel. And that's how committed I am. That's the work I'm putting in. And Phil says, well, I can, without a doubt, if, you, if that happens, I can give you my commitment that, that this $30 million will, ma- will not matter in the long run. And truthfully, they were right. Both of them were right. 
That he'd be that, one of the greatest players ever. He's one of the greatest players, if not the greatest to ever live, to walk the place of, and the thirty million to him now means nothing. And the Nike relationship and with uh, LeBron is probably worth billions. To billions. Me. I mean, his business is, is nearing a billion dollars, and both of them are right. And by the way, I always tell people that's why he's Phil Knight. That's why he's LeBron James. <laughs> They're, they're not making any more of both of these guys. But, but that's a business MBA type of case study, right? Yeah, think about that negotiation to ask that question. It's like, it's, it's just a way of thinking. It's a business, it's a very simple business principle that you know, and I came later to know of like, long-term view versus, sh- it's, it's simple. You do this every day. Like, I'm building my company. People made offers to buy it when we raised the money, but I'm like, we're still more, we're gonna keep building this, but you, I could have sold it. But and, and then if you anyone entrepreneur is building companies, like do I sell it now? Do I sell it a year from now? Do I wait ten years? Do I take it public? They were basically asking LeBron, how big is your company gonna be? How big? If he had a company, Phil was going, how big is your company gonna be? We think we can make your company this big. If you think your company is gonna be this big, then take the money and go. It's and you so, know it's that so that's so important. You must see that you. I mean, you run an investment banking firm. You're selling people's business all the time. You see people who come to you and go like. I've hit the ceiling. I need to cash out. Yep. There's nothing wrong with that. But if there's more room to go, bet, on, bet on yourself. Keep going. It's such an important story because it has a lot to do with alignment of two parties. has a lot to do with the negotiating strategy of Phil Knight, which was the card he had to play was that card because which otherwise is, he was going to lose. But, but remember, he's the card he's playing, which is brilliant, is... He's making LeBron tell the truth about himself. It's not, he's like, it's not us. We're going to do our thing. How good do you think you are? Right. So if you think you're really good, we're the right place. If right. you think you're just okay, I, I guess, there's th- I shouldn't say I guess. You know this and I know this. There's a thousand people who take the $30 million now. Right. LeBron has never been that guy. Never. He's always the guy like, I'm good. I'm so good. I tell people about this. It's weird to... To see that, to see him, because he'll do that all the time. He's th- he's done that five other times in our business career. Like, why are we, why would we sell the company now? We're just going. Like anything, I'm so, he just believes. You would have taken a thirty million. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I, but that's unfair because <laughs> the reason that's unfair. But now you. I could have sold. I could have sold my company when we raised the money in October, but I didn't. But. It's unfair because LeBron is quite possibly, if not, I mean, there's 7 billion people walking the earth. I don't know how many have walked the earth in the millions of years. He's quite possibly the greatest ever, if not the greatest ever, one of the three or four or two mm-hmm. yes. best ever For to sure. ever do it, or quite possibly the best. I don't know what it feels like to be that good at one thing. Imagine you were that good at one thing that... Every other person walking planet Earth, you are better than them at whatever. Pick a thing. I don't know that feeling. So when you wake up every day with that feeling, who the fuck knows how I would think? I mean, it's impossible to know how you would think. Right. So you could only advise to a point. To a point. To a point. Then he has to make the. And since he was eighteen, he would do this: make the decisions himself. And I call these gladiators. He's always been right, by the way. Yeah. He doesn't miss. And he's always been right because he bets on himself. He yep. doesn't. He doesn't even question anything else. Yep. And he knows what's right for LeBron. Yeah. He's he's always clear on that. Yeah. You have you have to keep making that bet. You have to keep putting the, the the dice, the cards, the middle of the pot. Right. You put the yeah exactly. You push the chips in. Yeah. You win. So if you had ten chips, now you have twenty. The other push him there, you push the 20 back in. Yeah. You win again, and you the get, 20's and now you get 40. smarter. And one day you could wipe out, but he's like, I'm not good. Yeah. I'll just keep pushing him in. Yeah. I'm that good. Yeah, which is why the, you gotta play long term. You gotta play long term. Until you if you know you can't, you gotta be smart enough to cash yes, out. Of course. Yeah. Of course. I think that I think that story is all about partnership, all about thinking long term. Has a lot of lessons for today because there's so much disappointing short term is in the market. Tell me about it. And it's very hard to match up long term minded people with long term minded capital. That's really hard. Yes. That's a great point. It's it's easier said than done. And it could be long term strategic capital, it could be long term financial capital, but ultimately goes to people 
and shared risk and shared upside, yep. right? And uh, usually people want zero sum game. I win, you lose. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Not not at that level. It's like that was the Nike LeBron relationship. It's like it's not. Well, if you believe you're going to be that great, we know Nike. We're this great. We'll both win if you if we both deliver on what we how good we both say we are, which they both did, and they both have had a fruitful relationship for 20 years, and it's going to go into the day past LeBron's life on earth is going to keep going the lebron sneakers and business will keep going and nike obviously had a track record by the time lebron showed up with michael jordan and and lebron believed that much in himself so it really is real and to your point i was there giving them the facts like here's what it is i can't i never built nike and i'm not you so i can't tell you exactly what to do and i don't know what that feeling feels like but there are nikes out there today the new nikes mm-hmm and there are the new LeBrons out there today, <laughs> and there, there are new Mavericks out there today, yep. right? And usually in times of chaos, post a pandemic, you know, with fears of a recession and unrest and a lot of strife, you have to look into the unknown and build through that. And that's where the best companies and some of the come out. best situations have come out of. And they're out there. And then you have to have a long-term perspective around it. Yep. And that's what drives us. Totally. Because you know, if you have your health and you have some good luck and some good fortune and some good decision-making, trust, the right relationships, the right network, the right community, principles, um, you know, friendships, you can play long. Totally. These are the tent poles. Totally. Like, my feeling is always like, what other bet do I have? Like, <laughs> I'm betting on me, my company in America. Like, I, I really actually don't have... <laughs> I don't have another company. This is <laughs> yeah. Spring Hill is the Spring Hill company is my. Co- I don't have like another company. I got to make this one work. Yeah. So I'm betting heavy on that. Yeah. I'm betting heavy on me because I'm me. Everywhere I am, there I am. So I am. I'm me, and I'm an American citizen who grew up in America. Shit's been crazy a lot of different times in America, and it comes out on the other side. And I'm. I don't have a passport, or I can't move to. Australia or Europe or my company can't go there. So like those are the three things I have to bet on. And though I have a lot of gripes with America, this is where I'm from, and I'm here to try and change it through the lens of my company and me. So those are the bets I'm making. And like if those things go sour, I'm over anyway. So like if America goes belly up, I'm toast. If my company shits to bed, I'm toast. And if I make bad decisions, I'm toast. Like those are my bets. So I'm, yeah. so I'm pushing the chips in on those things. I like it. And but taking you outside of America for one second, you and I and LeBron and some other friends hung out in London this summer. Yep. At the beginning of the that summer. That was fun. Yeah. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. And you had LeBron speak to your interns. <laughs> and and you too. Yes. And uh and I got you guys to give a little video recording. That's right. Uh to the interns at the big be- beginning of the program that's now come to a nice uh, nice end. And you gave some advice. LeBron gave some advice. Some other friends gave some advice. And I surprised them with a video at the beginning of the program. And your advice was always know how to quantify your upside versus your downside. Always know how to measure your downside. Explain that. What is the advice for the new generation coming out of school now in this period, not knowing what they have to bet on yet, but coming into this period, what is the advice? So that idea about what I talked to your interns about, about upside versus downside, really for me comes from playing cards and being a gambler. And when you play cards, the beauty of cards, my grandmother has a line, when you, like when I, you play a hand of cards and someone will say like, shit, if I know I already had the ace, I would have did this different. And my grandmother always go, son, that's why cards have backs on them. You can't see them because in life, you, have a, you get dealt a certain hand, whatever your hand is. And just like cards, you have to start immediately. Like once you look at one, if you're getting five cards, you look at one, you start going, I can win this hand or I can't. Like, oh, shit, I got a better shot. Mm, not so much. Because this is the information you have. The information you have is in your hand. I don't know what's in your hand. I don't know what's in her hand. I don't know what's in his hand because the cards have backs. Huh. But you, but you're betting, so you have to start immediately thinking about what are my chances of winning versus losing, 
based on the information that I have. This is why information is key, right? So then in any card game, there's cards in the center, and as the game goes around or what at poker, they you make a bet based on the then they give you more information. And you go like, oh shit, my upside here is bigger. I think I got a shot to win this. But when you're measuring your downside, you're going, but how much am I gonna how much am I gonna risk based on the information I have? So I have a certain amount of information. And in life and in business it works that way, right? Like I know what I have in my company. I know the the revenues issue. I, I can tell you every number in my company. I know where we're going, and I know where we can go. But if I call REA or Joe John Doe, they may give me some information about another company. That's like so, so then I have to start going like, oh fuck, based on what what John Doe told me, and REA told me, and she told me. There's other things happening that I have no control of, but I now have the information. And I thought we were, could get this far. We actually can go double that based yeah. on where the world is going because I have more information. And I talked about this. I gave a commencement speech at USC. When you were, the way I posed it to them in my speech, and I'll paraphrase myself, but was basically, you guys have a degree from fucking USC, one of the great institutions in the world. Well, that's your downside protection. That is, with a degree from USC, what I phrase as a good ass job, because <laughs> in my neighborhood, that's what it was, my grandmother, my aunt's called, they would say like, you know, their friend got a good ass job, which just meant a job that paid you decently, but you had insurance, you had a 401k, that was a good ass job, it kind of set you up to be okay, to pay your bills and live. I said, guys, you have a degree from USC. You always be able to get a good ass job. So if that's your downside, why not go for something else? Because if you go and start a business or go work at a place like Lion Tree or a place like Spring Hill and decide you're gonna fucking go for it and get a job at Spring Hill or get a job at Lion Tree and propose some deal that Live Nation should sell their company. We should put Live Nation and Spotify together and sell that to Apple. I'm making up shit. Yeah. It's not a real thing. Yeah. Go propose that. If you go to REA and he goes, that's the fucking dumbest idea I've ever heard. You're fired. You have The downside is you have a degree from USC yeah. and you can go to some of the other investment bank or some other place and you'll most likely get a job. So my point to them was based on the information you have, if you think about it in cards, you have that information. And as you now leave and graduate, you will actually get more information about yourself and the world, and you have to be okay with looking in the mirror and truly knowing who you are, because you will learn, you will get information about yourself too, like like as you talked about long-term versus short-term, like I am I work at Spring Hill today, it's my company, I'm building it. I wake up every day and look at myself in the mirror and I know, am I okay doing this the next 20 years? And I have to answer that question every fucking day. And you get that information about yourself, like, I love this, I like it, I like the people, I like the idea. So am I okay doing it for 20 years? If, if so, then keep going. So you have to get information about yourself, the world, the, the business you're in, and know your downside. And for me now, I have a proven career, right? Like, so if I... If you know you can't lose, you can only win. If I screw this thing up and blow it, depending on what happened... I could call you and you'd place find something for me or mate, you know. So you just always have to know your downside, and the more information you get, and the better you get, your downside actually comes up. Yeah, I, I call. I love it. The good ass job. Good ass job is a thing. It's a that thing. Comes to my grandma. I call that. I in call the black that, neighborhood. That was the thing. I call that like the trampoline. So, and I've talked about it before. Where if you are jumping on a trampoline, and you don't trust the foundation, you're not going so high because you could fall. Yes. You could fall right through. Yep. But if you know the foundation is strong, you jump on it. To the sky. And to the sky. And there's no ceiling. Yep. It's the same thing. Or a ball in the corner pocket of a pool match or billiards, right? You just leave it there. You leave it. And just go play somewhere else yep. for a while, right? Or the tree. The stronger the roots are, the higher up you can go. It's counterintuitive. People just want to build. But if you work on those roots mm -hmm. in the ground, you're going up high. Yep. Right? So the foundation that you have... Or you know when you're if you gamble, which I'm not, you put half your winnings in your pocket. You're going for it. You're playing with all. You're the playing, stuff. right? You're playing with everything. So if you know you can't lose, you can only win. Yeah, it's, it's investing. You get the principal back. Right. Go. Correct. 
So I think that's great advice. You know? Yeah, and it's, you know, I, can, I always told my mom, my mom who I love to death, my favorite person on earth, she worked the same job 28 years and retired. She was a social worker. She basically had a good ass job. We didn't have anything extra, but we had food and lights and he I always told her, Mom, I don't want a good ass job. I don't I wanna go for it. And she she hasn't told me it in a while because it's like my life now, but she said she would say to me when I was young in my company, I don't know how you do it. And she I said, Do what? She goes, When I got off work Friday at five o'clock, five o'clock on a Friday. Just gonna think you would never be able to do this, me either. <laughs> she goes, I didn't think about one thing work related again until Monday morning at eight. Friday at five to Monday morning at eight, I did not take one thing home from work and then think about work and do nothing. And she goes, You work it's your life is kind of perpetually. Even if I'm like on vacation, yeah. Even if I'm on vacation, <laughs> the restaurants always open. I'm like, Aria, come have lunch and let's <laughs> exactly, talk. Yeah, exactly. yes, that's what I always tell her. I always tell her, Mom. That's a funny thing because I always tell the people who work at our company too. I always say, you know, like when you go to a restaurant or a barbershop, it's like, sorry, we're closed. And yes, we're open. I always tell PR always says, I said, our sign says yes, we're open on both sides. <laughs> so don't even you can flip it if you want, but we're open. Yeah. <laughs> so she always says it, and I say, Mom. That's because you worked a job and you worked a good ass job and you worked to pay bills. I said, Mom, I don't really work. I go and do what I like to do and it happens to pay me and pay my bills, but I'm doing things that I want to do. I said, You worked, I run a company, it's two different things. But but I get her point. Some yeah. people feel that way, but that was where I grew up, like a good ass job, like Monday through eight, Friday at five, and I'm sure sometimes you, you wish you had. Sometimes I do think <laughs> exactly. It'd be sometimes really I go nice. like that. That seems much cleaner exactly. and more simple than my life. Much more straightforward. Exactly. It's much more. There's no gray area. It's not, it's not for everybody. It's not know? for everybody. But you know, my grandmother. You talked about your grandmother's advice. My grandmother gave me advice. Live life where you are. Don't try to put yourself somewhere else. That's a great. Piece Always of just live life where you are. That's a great. Piece and of and lean into it. And, you know. Yeah, and right where you are, enjoy. Just be in just that. Just be where you are and live life where you are. Yeah. You know. That's a great piece of advice. Instead of thinking about some other Correct. place or. Correct. And um, and that goes to the holistic approach. Totally. Right? Like do everything you want to do now. Absolutely. Let it compound. Yes, exactly. Right? Do other things later. Do other things later. Don't put it off. Yes. Live life where you are. That's a great line. You know? That's a fantastic line. So you take the wisdom of people that came before us, you get a good-ass job, and then you play <laughs> forward to what's to come, right? Exactly. And the best is yet to come. Exactly. Right, I appreciate your being here, my man. Thank you for having me. This was so much fun. So much fun, man. Cheers. You're the best. <laughs>